Good morning, everybody, and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests. It's a true honor uh, for a civilian to come and talk to you about uh, open trade and uh, talk with you about somebody who uses the sea every day to, uh, to do our livelihood. So I hope, uh, I hope some of the, the thoughts that we can share will be uh, useful for you. By way of introduction, I uh, work for a company called Maersk, and uh, we are a global leader in transportation and in shipping. And um, we, we move uh, one in five containers in the world, and uh, one in three that is refrigerated with uh, a lot of the world's food. And um, my background, uh, is that uh, I'm an executive in the company, and, uh, but I started my, my life as a master mariner, and I started my life at sea. And um, some, of the, some of the things I'm gonna share today has personal reflections around what safety and what open trade at sea actually means. I, I have three things uh, to share this morning. I want to make the case for open trade and why it's important, why it's important for world prosperity, and why seaborne trade is particularly important. Then I want to share a MERS uh, perspective about peace and security. We were founded in 1904 and has sailed through a century or more of global conflicts. And um, I want to share some of the things, uh, what does it look like from a civilian point of view when the world unhinges. And then the last part, which I think is the important part, is our thoughts about what current challenges and future challenges we see. And we selected uh, four topics uh, to talk about. The weaponization of trade. We're going to talk about piracy. We're going to talk about cybersecurity. And we're going to talk about climate change. So I hope these uh, topics are important and uh, something that is on your mind. I want to start with why open trade is important. If you look at um, some of the barriers to trade and what has happened in recent human history, then um, there's been a decline in tariffs. We have created a rule-based system for how to interact and trade with each other through global institutions and uh, communication cost and connectivity in the world has improved to a level that uh, it has set a say, stage for something very exciting. Trade equals prosperity. And the, the two curves that you're looking at here really shows the, the growth in trade and the decline in uh, extreme poverty. Poverty, sorry. And it's, it's worth noting that in the data set that we're looking here from 1990 to 2015, 25 years, by some academics, every day for those 25 years, 135,000 people was lifted out of extreme poverty every day. 36% living below the line in 1990, 10% in 2015. Obviously, there's more people in the world in the meantime, but I think it is uh, remarkable to see that trade growth and trade openness has coincided with a very large reduction in poverty. Eighty percent of world trade is seaborne, and um, we estimate that market to 17 trillion. And uh, of course, seaborne trade has many phases, and we are engaged in most of them. But one important part of the, um, of the curves and the drivers for the curves that you saw before has been the invention of the container. It is, and I guess this picture shows, uh, shows what has happened. On one general cargo, expensive, slow, a lot of damages, pilferage, ships in port for a very long time. And on the other one, a modern container ship uh, and not even one of the largest ones, but carrying containers around the world for, for cost per products where it doesn't really matter anymore where you produce things. 
a pair of sneakers produced in Indonesia will be consumed in Los Angeles or in the high street of London, and it will cost euro cents or dollar cents to move those pair of sneakers from one part of the world to another. We are moving agricultural products like hay in containers, and it is cost effective to move from Spain to the Middle East and so forth. So it, it is quite remarkable what uh, the steel box has done for the world. It is also <clears throat> important that uh, safe, open shipping lanes are crucial for world trade if 80% of it is carried on ships. So, if you have in the back of your mind that it's a $7 trillion <clears throat> global trade market, 80% is coming by ships, and if you believe, as we believe, that this has a very positive impact on poverty reduction and prosperity for the world, then um, I, I want to show Musk's uh, experiences with when conflict happens, and uh, I will tell that through our eyes. So we are founded in 1904 and has been, and I selected four here, I could have selected more, but I selected four that has been significant. So if I go back, then uh, during the world wars, a number of our ships were sunk by German submarines, a lot of merchant uh, Mariners from Maersk died, and uh, during both world wars, our ships had orders in case of conflict to seek allied ports and render their services to those countries. What that means is that if you're a commercial company, then on the eve of 1940, you, you let the ship sail to British ports or American ports or in this part of the world to your ports, and then, um, and then uh, seven years later, you get your ships back, slightly worn, uh, broken, and you start rebuilding the fleet. Um, in Korea, we moved troops and, and, um, and supplies into the theater of operation. During the Iran and Iraq war, um, and like we do today, we sail oil in and out of the Gulf. Um, Four of our VLCCs, there's a picture of one of them here, an older model, was hit by gunboats and by missiles, and people got killed or hurt, um, moving crude oil from the Gulf to North Europe, to Japan, or to the United States. And uh, the last one here is uh, from the first Gulf War, where we, where we offered uh, some of our combined vessels that can, has railroad cap capabilities uh, to move uh, goods from the United States to, to the Gulf. I started my career in, in Maersk in 1990, and my first ship was the Adrian Maersk, which is the vessel there uh, to, the, to the left of you. And, um, and um, I signed on in Dubai in the middle of January in 91. There was not a lot of people on the plane from Amsterdam, um, I remember. And, um, we dumped our cargo in the upper Gulf and we sailed out and as we cleared the Strait of Hormuz, the, the fighting started. And then we continued to come back with, uh, with goods. So when you go into conflict, many of these ships uh, come behind and move the, the goods that you need. Um, another thing that happens uh, all the time, and I picked two examples, one an old one and a, a current one. Um, so when there's conflict, there's migrants and there's refugees at sea. Um, it is important uh, to shipping in general, but to us in particular, to, to uh, live by solas and respect uh, the laws of the sea. And uh, when people are in distress, we pick them up. We've also noticed that this is not common for all ships to do. Um, one example here is Klam Ask. Uh, uh, during the Vietnam conflict, uh, in, in one go, select, uh, picked up over 3,000 people, and there was many more of these examples. Um, over the last many years, we have maybe collected 4,000 plus people from the Mediterranean when our ships are transiting from the Strait of Gibraltar to the Suez Canal or the other way. And uh, a recent example here is um, 
is uh, one example here is from the Alexander Mursk. And uh, these are tall ships and with women and children and people who are weakened to, to crawl up the, the side of the vessel in bad weather is uh, quite unnerving. We also, uh, the proud uh, um, contributor to the US Armed Forces, we have for decades been providing both uh, commercial ships and gray ships in support of, um, of uh, the, the Rapid Sea Lift Command and um, the uh, voluntary uh, intermodal uh, system. And um, this means that uh, our ships are used to support the missions that um, the US decides to go into. This is a small business uh, for us, but uh, one we are very happy about. And uh, I think it's a, a good example of private-public partnerships where, where skills can be used to um, be more efficient. So, so just before I move on, it's, um, it, every single day there is a, an incident somewhere in the world where one of the 700 plus big ships and the many uh, smaller tugboats are involved in some level of, uh, of a rescue operation or, or incident. So given that they're sailing all over the world uh, at all times and constantly, obviously we experience a lot. And, uh, and um, I will, I'll dive into that uh, with a little more detail now. So if we look ahead, and also current challenges, we picked four. And um, all four of them are, are very important, we believe. And I want to talk about uh, these uh, in some detail now. The first one is uh, weaponization of trade, piracy, cybersecurity, and climate change. <clears throat> so if we talk about weaponization of trade, and for us, this is sanction and restrictions. And um, we deal with a lot of regulation, given what we do around the world. And uh, we comply with that regulation uh, and the legal sanctions that is in place at any given time. And we spend great resources to make sure that, um, that we are diligent and careful about how we move all these goods around the world. It's important that the cargo is legal. And we also understand that sanctions is an effective uh, way to keep order, safety, and, uh, and uh, regulate the world. What we have seen in recent years, however, is that uh, we've seen an increase in both countries, individuals, and companies that is, um, that is being sanctioned. And uh, in a real way, trade is often the first casualty of conflict. And, uh, and we believe that this should be a balancing act. Um, remembering that uh, the countries that uh, trade with each other are more likely uh, not to fight. And, uh, and also remembering the extreme benefit the world has gotten from open trade. The second point is around piracy. And uh, as a mariner, um, my first experience with piracy was as a young uh, second officer of sailing through the Malacca Strait at night where you, you look uh, at the ocean, all of a sudden there's an unlit boat that sails very fast towards you with no lights on and you get a bit uh, afraid of what's going on. And uh, because of course you have heard about all the things that, it, that is happening. And uh, you wonder how much can this water spray actually help you? Um, and the only thing you can do when you put lights on them and you call them and they're not responding is that you try to ram them. And, uh, and uh, normally, given that the ships were very large, they, they then back off. Um, but this is the reality of a lot of mariners every day, that they, they are in this experience. And uh, we have had our fair share of uh, attacks uh, and it's unfortunately happening often. Um, 
I don't know if you've seen the movie about the mask Alabama, but that uh, was one uh, such case in, in recent history. But, but what we are really worried about is, uh, is the shifting threat of piracy that is moving uh, to the Gulf of Guinea in West Africa. And we're worried because it, it seems to be more random, it seems to be more violent, and, um, and, um, and we cannot protect the ships. So we're not allowed to have guards on board, we're not, uh, so we're pretty much on our own. And um, I, one of my jobs is to sit on the company's crisis committee and uh, recently, I've been on telephone calls where, um, where our ships are attacked and the captain has to get the crew into the citadel in the engine room, which is uh, just a reinforced uh, steel locker. And uh, you have to call uh, the authorities in Nigeria and ask for their help to, to free the ship. And, uh, and then you hear a lot of shooting on the phone and uh, luckily nobody got, got hurt. But, uh, it, it's, um, I, I think it's worth reflecting on how in 2019, piracy can still be such a major issue for the world. This is some of the stats, and I think it shows uh, that we have a problem in, in West Africa, and this part of the world uh, still remains challenged, uh, despite all the good work that uh, is, is being done. Um, I, what I can tell with great certainty is that uh, for all my colleagues who is working on the seas, they're very happy when they see some of your vessels sailing close to them and uh, the help that you provide um, when it gets challenging. So on behalf of all of us, thanks for that. The next one is cybersecurity, and um, in 2017, we were about to update uh, our tax IT assist, uh, software in Ukraine is one of the many countries where we do um, business. And uh, every company in Ukraine has to pay VAT and tax through this application. What was not known at the time was that in the software update there was a, a quite malicious uh, virus, which um, because our, our networks are truly global to move all this trade around, um, within hours, um, yeah, the entire network was uh, dark and uh, we had lost the visibility about uh, all our information ranging from uh, where, where the containers were, what was in them, the documents around it. And um, luckily we, we, we got the, the network restarted, it took a while. Uh, there was real cost involved in this, but, but more, probably more than anything it, it was um, it, it was a, a strong reminder about how vulnerable some of these critical infrastructure systems to, to countries and the world are to cyber. Since then, we have uh, invested a lot to harden uh, our capabilities to deal with this, but, um, and, uh, and every week uh, we are we're seeing civil attacks to our networks. Um, I think this is an area to, to worry about and, and make sure that there is uh, capabilities to deal with, both for companies and states. It is interesting to think about what would happen if, uh, in this case, uh, a fifth of the capacity in the world to carry trade around in containers would, would have been taken out of, uh, out of business for a significant uh, period of time. I mean, that, that would have an uh, a huge implication to, to trade in general. My, um, my last uh, point um, on, on future challenges is around the climate crisis. Uh, you are all aware of the Paris Agreement and, uh, and the goals that was, um, that was set there. Global shipping uh, is about two to three percent of global emissions. Um, so you could ask, uh, is it uh, realistic to decarbonize um, shipping globally? Um, at Maersk, we, we, have a, we, we have a clear view on this. Um, so, but let me just share a little bit where we've been coming from. So 
through technology, through larger ships, through efficiency, slow steaming, things like that, we have reduced 41% uh, uh, per unit we move in the world over the last decade. And if we look ahead to 2030, we can see up to 60% of reduction. The problem is that there's more containers being moved or more trade being moved, so emission stays the same. So um, we, we have recently set ourselves what we believe is a bold target uh, to get to carbon neutrality by 2050. And, um, and we think this is uh, necessary to protect the climate, but also for transportation and seaborne transportation to stay relevant. Um, We, um, so 2050, is that a long time away? Well, that means that the first ships that has to be able to do this will have to leave the yards by 2030. And for those of you who try to build ships, you know that 10 years is not a long time. And uh, this will require uh, new propulsion, it will require new energy sources, it's gonna require a lot of uh, innovation. So at the recent, uh, climate meeting in the UN in New York, we uh, launched the carbon neutral um, coalition where we, where we really want to collaborate within our industry with yards and manufacturers of, of equipment about how can we solve that problem together. Uh, this is not, um, this is a tough industry to do it in and we think maybe if we, as the leader in this industry uh, goes first, then maybe others could be inspired to do the same in some of the other hard industries to solve. And um, there, there's no alternative for seaborne transport to the world if we want to continue to trade with each other. Uh, we think that the climate crisis is real and, um, and we, we see the effect on, on, on our ships uh, on a daily basis and uh, we want to be part of the solution to this. But of course, also maybe to some of the other parts of the presentation that are made, if climate change becomes worse in many parts of the world, what will happen with all these refugees and migrants that we collect from the sea today, um, as one example. So it, it's really a question of how and uh, finding new ways and then uh, creating that shift. So uh, we are excited about that. We don't know how to do it, um, but, um, but uh, we are sure that with as many things we have tried before, that we'll find a way to solve it and uh, hopefully the first vessels will leave the yards within the next decade um, to, to show that also these problems can be solved when we work together. My last point is really um, just to recap. And um, I think open, open trade and the impact it has has on the world is, uh, irrespective of where you come from, from the political spectrum, it is hard uh, to, to not agree with the very positive uh, impact it has had on many, many millions of people around the world. It has also created other problems from uh, middle classes in the, in the Western world, um, but for humanity as such, this is a net benefit. 80% of that trade is carried by ships. These ships need open and safe waterways, and they need to be protected. And, um, and uh, this is important. When conflict uh, starts, um, both civilians and military alike will, will see these uh, in, in many different ways. And uh, I think I gave some good examples on what that has meant for us. And then when we look ahead, then uh, more sanctions, more barriers, more rules in the world makes uh, the whole global system um, um, more difficult to operate. And we will, we will do that, but it's accelerating in that direction. Um, the piracy in 2019 is still an issue to the point where the thousands of people we have sailing our ships uh, see this as maybe their number one worry when they go to work every day. Um, 
the Gulf of Guinea is a particular issue that needs to be solved, and uh, we are working with international organizations as nation states to get help with that. Um, Cybersecurity almost uh, put down one of the one of the shipping companies that moves the world, and uh, we see more of this, and we think this is something that needs to be in the plans of people who protect trade. And then uh, the climate change is uh, is, uh, is is a global problem that uh, we want to be part of the solution to. And given that we move a lot of the world's trade and we also pollute a lot. We want to find solutions to this uh, over the next decade and build ships that can continue to, uh, to move trade around the world as we have done for millennia. With these uh, words, I will, uh, I will stop my presentation and uh, look forward to the uh, questions and answers and the panel we'll have later. Thank you for listening and thank you for the invitation. Uh, thanks, Mr. Sensen, for that uh, very informative brief from the shipping industry perspective. Um, I'd like to move now into part two of session three and invite Admiral Chris Barry. Admiral Barry is a retired naval officer, but very closely associated still with the Navy. Uh, he served as our Chief of Defence Force from 1998 to 2002. Sir. Uh, over the next couple of days, as you meet our leaders of industry and trade uh, and form those special partnerships and those special bonds, because we work together and you will find that those relationships will serve you well into the future. Thanks very much, Keith. Small take. Well, Barry, great to have you with us. Thank you, sir. Well, hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here and uh, uh, a terrific pleasure to be able to speak at this Sea Power Conference after a gap of about 10 years. Uh, and uh, the second thing I'd like to say, Keith, is I wish I had heard that presentation uh, when I was running the show because I, I thought there was a lot of content in there that would be news to nearly all of us. Uh, and it's really interesting because, um, you know, navies used to talk about naval control and protection of shipping as though it was a major role. And yet there are serious concerns being expressed in the United States right now about the ability of the US Navy to do the kind of job that would be needed and I guess that actually reflects on all of us. If we thought about uh, conflict breaking out, how would we deal with the issues of trade that have really underpinned our lifestyle and the sorts of futures that we would like to have? I'm not going to go through um, the content of geopolitics in the region. What I am going to do is talk about risk, because I think that was my business when I was Chief of the Defence Force. And when I stand back now and look at our region, the Indo-Pacific, I think about risk in this way. Uh, the, you know, one of the real challenges is China, a rising power. We really don't know what the future holds in the relationship with China, but there's a lot of concern about it. Uh, my words, in the next 30 years, uh, we will be encircled by China, whether we like it or not. Uh, and the second part of that story is, of course, uh, that encirclement isn't going to just be in what we used to call the Asia-Pacific region. It is going to be in the Indo-Pacific region. And it sort of makes you think the Atlantic's going to be a nice, quiet, benign place compared to our region. Now, the second uh, risk that I see for the Indo-Pacific region is population growth. We live in a world now which is around 7.5 to 8 billion people. Uh, that's unprecedented. But even more unprecedented are the predictions will be about 10 billion people uh, by 2050. And the bulk of those people are going to live in the Indo-Pacific region. And there are some surprises when you ask demographers about this. For example, in 2050 the United Nations estimates there will be 640 million Africans with a middle class income. Is that going to change the dynamics of the region that we think we know and understand? I think it is. And it has all sorts of implications for the way we're going to man manage uh, geopolitics. And the final point that I want to make is about population densities. Uh, so 
Uh, I've been talking over the last year or so about the potential for a major security risk of Australia to be mass migrations from people in the Indo-Pacific region who are looking for a new home. And that has got real implications for a Navy. So the picture I just want to paint to you is about population densities in 2050. And the most dense country on the planet by per square kilometre is Singapore. In Singapore, the UN estimates there will be 9,291 people living in every square kilometre. But that'll probably be managed if I know the Singaporeans. The second uh, most dense country on the planet in 2050, if it still exists, will be Bangladesh. 1,370 people per square kilometre. India, 519. And here's a bit of a surprise for those of us that live in this part of the world. The Philippines, 495. Vietnam, 341. Pakistan, 389. Sri Lanka, 318. The DPRK, 224. Indonesia, 170. Doesn't sound too bad. Timor-Leste, 146. Australia, 5. You get my point? It's exacerbated in our region by climate change consequences. A very high risk that fresh water will not be available to the bulk of those populations the way we see the future. The disappearance of the Himalayan glacier, or the third pole as we call it, means reliable fresh water for the entire Asian subcontinent disappears. The future for the countries of China are sweeping around to Pakistan, Afghanistan and the Middle East lies in collecting water from the monsoon and the typhoons. And that means big dams. Well, the last time I was challenged on that, I was talking to a bunch of people from South Asia. And one of the issues that they raised was, how do you move five or six million people off their land to build a new dam? So it's a serious challenge. And with the lack of fresh water will also go a lack of food. And once people starve, they will do anything. So these are the kinds of problem that I see as a risk person in our future. And I'm not confident that we've got any solutions to this. And I'm not confident that we can actually control our future in the Indo-Pacific region in these circumstances. So thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much, sir. I'd now like to invite Dr. David Brewster. Dr. David Brewster is a Senior Research Fellow at the National Security College. Thank you, sir. Thank you and good morning. So I'd like to provide a perspective on developments in the strategic environment of the Indo-Pacific and how Australia and other partners can contribute to peace and security across the region. In looking at this, let me say a few words about the Indo-Pacific. This is important because the terminology and concepts often get confused. It's important that we're clear in what we're talking about to avoid unnecessary confusion. The starting point is our traditional understanding of the Pacific and Indian Oceans as two entirely separate strategic theatres. What happened in one theatre was perceived as having only a very limited impact on the other. This meant that it made some sense for Australia to define itself 
as being part of the Asia Pacific and to really see the Indian Ocean region in completely separate terms. And that made really quite some sense at that time. But changes to our strategic environment means that this is really no longer tenable and we have to reimagine what our region is. And we're increasingly seeing strategic interactions between uh, the Pacific and Indian Ocean. And this includes China's activities in the Indian Ocean, India's growing interests in the Pacific, and there's many other examples uh, I could give. So these changes are leading us to increasingly understand the entire Asian littoral as a single strategic space. And where that space begins and ends and how it actually works is still open to debate and different interpretations. And some people get worried about these differences, but I don't really see it as a significant problem. In fact, different countries will naturally see things in different ways based on their geography and history. In fact, I would argue that one of the greatest strengths of the Indo-Pacific as an idea is its flexibility. There's no lines on the map, there's no formal structures, there's no piece of paper to sign or not sign. But nevertheless, in broad terms, uh, many countries understand the Indo-Pacific as really just a way of understanding the world around us and the significant changes that are happening in our strategic environment that will require us to do things differently in coming years. In fact, in retrospect, it's pretty obvious that Australia, for one thing, would see the entire Asian littoral stretching from the Korean Peninsula to the Strait of Hormuz as a strategic, single strategic space uh, where maritime concerns predominate. So the Indo-Pacific describes a newly imagined region based on strategic interactions. And whether you'd like to use that term or want to use a different term to describe it doesn't really matter and it doesn't really change the reality. I'm actually quite amused when the Chinese government rejects the term Indo-Pacific and then in the next breath starts talking about the BRI and its new presence in the, in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, and really what is the BRI but the Indo-Pacific with Chinese characteristics? So one of the big points that I want to make today is that the Indo-Pacific is our imagined region, but it is not a strategy. But the Indo-Pacific as a region does require a strategy towards it, and every country will have a somewhat different strategy towards it. From an Australian perspective, that of an activist middle power, it's quite natural that the strategy, any strategy towards our region will prioritise two things. Firstly, the strengthening of international rules and secondly, coalition building. So I'm not going to dwell on the international rules part and UNCLOS today, you'll hear a lot of that from other people, but I'd like to talk about coalition building and this is something that Australia has done a lot of since 1945, and in fact, we're very good at doing it. So, as we all know, the biggest change in the Indo-Pacific strategic environment is the rise of China as a major power and the relative decline in US dominance. But it's not just about that relationship. There are a lot of other important players in the region. In the Indian Ocean, for example, the uh, India-China relationship is probably the most important. Similarly, um, among the Pacific Island states, Australia plays a key role. But there are a lot of other important players in the region, whether it be Japan, France, Indonesia and many others. And all this suggests that the Indo future Indo-Pacific uh, uh, strategic environment is going to be a complex multilateral environment. Uh, and in fact, for several years, we've been seeing the development of new and more complex strategic geometries reflecting this. 
and this has been demonstrated in a few ways. For one thing, US alliance partners have been supplementing their bilateral relationships with the United States, uh, the so-called hub and spoke system, with stronger relationships between each other, essentially connecting uh, the spokes. And the growing Australia-Japan security relationship is really a great example of this. Another trend is for closer bilateral security linkages between US allies and other like-minded countries uh, that want to cooperate, but for their own reasons, wish to stay outside the US alliance system. And the Australia-India defence relationship is really a good example of this. A third trend, which I'll um, spend a little bit more time on, is the establishment of so-called minilateral security dialogues, which involve small informal groupings of states that share common interests on particular issues. Now, these networks are still in quite a nascent state, and, but they provide highly valuable forums for the discussion of security issues and could ultimately provide new structures for cooperation across the Indo-Pacific, perhaps even one day the building blocks of a broader security architecture. Now, there's a lot of examples of these, and I'll just give a few. For several years, Australia, uh, India and Japan have participated in regular trilateral security dialogue at the foreign secretary level. And this has been a really successful vehicle for exchanging views on issues of concern. Another prospective triangle focused on the Eastern Indian Ocean involves Australia, India and Indonesia. And the three countries have been holding regular senior officials meetings on shared interests in the Indian Ocean and elsewhere. And uh, my understanding is that those meetings have really been uh, very, very fruitful. Yet another important regional structure is the so-called quadrilateral involving Australia, India, Japan and the US, which resumed in 2017 after a 10 year hiatus. Now this group is evolving slowly and in a step by step way and it isn't clear what the next steps will be. Possibly India is the most hesitant uh, of the partners at the moment, uh, that changes. Um, but all parties will probably want to see an incremental approach towards developing a four-way, a four-partner security relationship as a graduated response to future Chinese assertiveness. Now, in my view, we shouldn't get too hung up about the Quad, as there's a lot of other structures in our region for like-minded countries to work together. But uh, the recent meeting of uh, foreign ministers from the four Quad countries in New York indicates that the uh, the, those countries are starting to take it a bit more seriously on a step-by-step -step basis. Okay, so what does all this mean in practice in, in terms of uh, cooperation in the maritime security space? As I mentioned, Australia, since 1945, Australia has really played a crucial role in building coalitions right across the world in a variety of issues. And it's become really one of Australia's great strengths uh, in its international relations. And I think Australia, again, can play a very important role in coalition building across our region. Now, one immediate area for cooperation is in ensuring that infrastructure is developed in a beneficial way for the region. Now, we all have heard recent criticisms of some of China's BRI projects. Uh, focusing on corruption, lack of economic sustainability, ulterior motives, etc. In my view, we should respond to these criticisms by helping to build regional norms to ensure the development of quality, sustainable infrastructure, but also by offering alternatives. We can't just tell developing countries who need investment to just say no we have to offer them alternatives. So, for example, Australia and other like-minded countries could better coordinate their investments, for example, in the Pacific Island states, 
Uh, one great example is the recently announced project by Australia, Japan, the US and New Zealand to develop the electricity system of Papua New Guinea. And that project really shows how countries can work together to leverage uh, uh, what they do best. The Quad countries and others such as France can also better coordinate their activities in the Indian Ocean. Japan is currently sponding, uh, sponsoring many infrastructure investments in the Indian Ocean region on a scale that rivals and sometimes exceeds China's. Uh, that's really very little known, even among the experts. Uh, but we need to take better advantage of this and coordinate our efforts and think about how Australia, India, the United States and others such as France can contribute and strengthen uh, these efforts. Finally, um, I should mention the importance of using Coast Guard agents as agencies as a means of engagement with many countries in the region. Alongside navies, Coast Guards are really a vital tool of regional engagement. Uh, they are seen in, in many cases as non-threatening and non-political. And they can do many things in many countries that uh, navies are often constrained um, from doing. Many small countries in our region also only have coast guards rather than navies, and so therefore it's natural to use coast guards as a tool for engagement. But currently there's little coordination of the work of coast guards, and in my view, uh, Australia, the United States, Japan and India should form a quad of Coast Guard agencies to coordinate their activities across the Indo-Pacific. The four countries can work together to identify countries that need security assistance and then coordinate uh, who should be providing that assistance and how. And in that way, we can leverage our mutual strengths. Uh, that, in my view, uh, would be a major contribution to regional security. So that's just one suggestion, but there's a lot of other ways that Australia can work with its partners to build uh, security in the Indo-Pacific. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Brewster. Um, I've just asked Dr. Brewster to join the panel. Um, at the end of this session, we will have a question and answer session. Um, so just a reminder that use your app or Twitter um, to ask any questions throughout that period of time. Uh, and now I'd like to invite Dr. Joanne Wallace to the stage. Joanne is the Senior Lecturer and Director of Studies in the Strategic and Defence Study Centre. Thanks, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you. Um, it's an honour to speak today and I very much thank Captain Sean Andrews for the invitation. I really appreciate it. So I'm here as an expert on security and Australia's strategy in the Pacific Islands and as a quick advertisement I recently published a book with Melbourne University Press on Australia's strategy in the Pacific. Now while Australian foreign policy debates have latterly paid increasing attention to the Pacific Islands, the region's strategic importance to Australia has long been overlooked by far too many scholars, practitioners and commentators who have a tendency to look over the Pacific Islands to the US and North Asia and to forget that the islands lay in between. And this is demonstrated in the way that domestic, sorry, that diplomatic and military postings in the Pacific are generally seen as second best to those in North America, North Asia or Europe. However, as any military historian will tell us, the Pacific Islands are central to the defence of the Australian mainland, as well as to some of our most important sea lanes of communication, which are key to maintaining our way of life. And I think Keith set that out very well, and it's something that I've, I've experienced in my own life too. Although the Pacific Islands have recently been rediscovered by Australian strategic and fo um, foreign policy makers and thinkers with Australia's comprehensive step up in the region, the tangible manifestation of this, I am concerned about the state of Australia's strategic and foreign policy towards the region. Now, the title of this session is Framing the Indo-Pacific. And as we all know, since the 2013 Defence White Paper, 
the Australian government has identified that its zone of strategic interest is the Indo-Pacific. Now, while academic and policy debates about the Indo-Pacific concept has been voluminous, the question of how the Pacific Islands fit into this strategic region has until recently been overlooked. Indeed, Dame Meg Taylor, who is the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, emphasised during her keynote address to the State of the Pacific Conference held at the Australian National University last year, her concern about, quote, the recasting of geostrategic competition and cooperation under the rubric of the Indo-Pacific. Taylor was concerned that the Indo-Pacific formulation encouraged external powers to overlook the particularities and interests of Pacific Islands and to see the region primarily through the lens of geostrategic competition between the major powers. This perception is enhanced by the fact that much of the recent Australian media and commentariat discussion of the Pacific Islands has focused on the risk that potentially hostile China could establish a strategic foothold in the region from which it could threaten Australia. These concerns were given added impetus in April last year with reports that China was in talks to build a military base in Vanuatu, noting that those were subsequently denied by both the Chinese and Vanuatu governments. Although not explicitly presented as a counter to the Indo-Pacific formulation, Pacific Islands leaders have developed the concept of the Blue Pacific to frame their region. This formulation is intended to encourage Pacific Island states to act as a blue continent based on their shared stewardship of the Pacific Ocean as large ocean states. Dame Meg Taylor has argued that this could see the Pacific Islands, quote, exercising stronger strategic autonomy understanding the strategic value of our region and maintaining our solidarity in the face of those who seek to divide us. So this raises the question of how the Indo-Pacific and Blue Pacific concepts might relate to each other. In June this year, alongside James Batley and Anthony Bergen, I convened a workshop at the Australian National University at which Australian, New Zealander and Pacific Island scholars and practitioners considered this question. From the discussion, it became clear that Australians, New Zealanders and Pacific Islanders are concerned about the implications of the changing geopolitics of the region, but that they did not always share the same geopolitical perspective. While the concept of the Indo-Pacific is often interpreted in Australian debates to imply an effort to draw in states such as the US, Japan and India to counterbalance an increasingly assertive China, not all Pacific Island states necessarily see China as potentially threatening. According to Dame Meg Taylor, a friends to all approach is commonly accepted in the Pacific. And as Captain Tawake said yesterday, Fiji and other Pacific states want the Pacific to be a shared space, not a contested one. So Australians need to be cognizant of the differences between our geostrategic, geostrategic perceptions and those of the Pacific Islands, particularly when there is discussion in Australian circles about the potential for a new Cold War. Well, it's important not to be too relativistic and treat Australia and China as morally equivalent. One is an imperfect democracy and the other is authoritarian. For many Pacific Islanders, Australia is not seen as inherently good. And not for that matter is the US or France, which have both tested atmospheric nuclear weapons in the region and both continue to have Pacific colonies. So we can't assume that our attempts to exercise leadership will result in Pacific Islands followership. Australian colonialism is within the living memory of many Nauruans and Papua New Guineans. Bougainvilleans have vivid memories of Australian donated helicopters being turned into gunships. And Manusians and Nauruans live with the consequences of Australia's Pacific solution. Now the workshop discussion also highlighted the importance of non-traditional security issues in the Pacific Islands and particularly the nexus between security and development, and the risk that by using the Pacific, Indo-Pacific framing, Australia could be perceived to be primarily focused on traditional geostrategic concerns at their expense. Most significantly as Colin Beck, the permanent secretary of the Solomon Islands Ministry of Foreign Affairs and External Trade said in his keynote speech, climate change is quote, a death sentence for the Pacific. Indeed, climate change was recognised as the single greatest threat to the region in the Pacific Island Forum's 2008 Boy Declaration. While Australia's efforts at climate, ad ad climate adaptation in the Pacific Islands are significant, at the workshop it was noted that there has been less emphasis on climate mitigation, which is a priority in the region. 
Australia's failure to take serious domestic policy, um, policy action to meet its Paris Agreement targets raises questions about our commitment to our Pacific family. And we need to remember that for the Pacific, and I'd add also for us, climate change is a certain threat. At least at the moment, China is only a potential one. So what does this mean for Australia's strategic and foreign policy approach towards the Pacific Islands? Well, first, it suggests that Australia needs to consider how its use of the Indo-Pacific framing is perceived by Pacific Island states. And bear in mind that the interests of those states, both collectively and individually, in its framing of its strategic interests. The Blue Pacific framing might provide a useful alternative entry point for Australia to engage with Pacific Island states about our shared interests in the Pacific Ocean. Second, Australia needs to be circumspect about our ability to exercise influence. And indeed, my whole book is about our declining influence in the region. Um, and, engage, uh, and our ability to engage um, with Pacific Island states um, sorry, and, our, um, and not assume that our strategic, in, in the Pacific, our strategic interests in the Pacific Island states will necessarily be mirrored by um, those states themselves. Third, Australia needs to be wary of creating a self-fulfilling prophecy of strategic competition with China in the Pacific Islands or more broadly. The Indo-Pacific should be reframed, I'd argue, um, as a, a region that seeks opportunities for partners to work together to build confidence and diffuse tensions. The Pacific Islands seems an ideal location in which this could start to take place, with Pacific Island states already using creative diplomatic tools to engage with, Pacific Chi um, with Australia, China and other partners. And to again quote Captain Tawake, Pacific Island states want the region to be guided by partnership, cooperation and dialogue. Fourth, to ensure the success of the step up in the Pacific Islands, Australia needs to make sure that the significant investments we've committed to make are perceived to meet the needs of the region as well as our own. Climate change is the most obvious point of friction that raises questions in the Pacific Islands about our commitment and attitude to the region, but there are others as well, such as our policy of processing and resettling refugees in Papua New Guinea and Nauru, and our policy of criminal deportations to the region. Finally, and related to this, Australia needs to think critically about some of our strategic and foreign policy assumptions. Australia likes to talk about protecting the rules-based order, but we demonstrate remarkably little criticism, little critical reflection about what those rules are, who made them, whether they serve everyone's interests, and whether we obey those rules all the time ourselves. The same can be said about talk of shared values. What exactly are those values? Who do we share them with? And do we always promote those values ourselves? Australia also likes to talk about our alliances and partnerships, but how reliable are they? What do we need to do now to strengthen them for the future? Is it time to institutionalise our US alliance? And what would happen if the US did not come to our aid? What plans do we need to make now to ensure ourselves if that occurs? Now, I don't have access to the intelligence that many people in this room do, but if the situation is as grim as many people want us to believe, then now is the time to ask ourselves these difficult questions. We don't want to rely on our assumptions only to find that they are wrong when it really matters. But something that doesn't change is our strategic geography. The Pacific Islands and Indonesia will always be, and this is to paraphrase the Dib Review, the region through which a threat to Australia could most easily be posed. We need to ask ourselves whether we are listening to what Pacific Island states tell us and whether what we are saying and doing is the right thing and enough to ensure that the Pacific remains Pacific. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wallace. Uh, now we'll go to our question and answer session. We've got uh, approximately 15 to 20 minutes, um, so please ensure that your questions are coming through. So, sir, I'll start off with Admiral Barry, a question from the audience. How might China be engaged in a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific? Sir. Sorry, what was the first part of that? How might China be engaged in a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific? Well, um, 
we could all see a situation where China played a responsible role in building coalitions and better futures, but at the moment uh, the story doesn't look that way. The story actually looks uh, quite the opposite. So uh, let's take fresh water in the uh, Himalayan glacier, for example. Uh, the Chinese are trying to turn the water around now to their own, for their own use uh, and starve the other countries of its use. Now, that, if you like, is a macro Murray-Darling Basin situation when Queensland starves South Australia. Secondly, of course, um, there is significant competition between the two most populated countries, China and India. Uh, they don't look each other in the eye all that well. Uh, and there are issues uh, both from both sides about that that do need resolution. Uh, and then uh, finally, of course, um, because I, I just want to pick up on the Coast Guard issue for a minute. Um, the Chinese Coast Guard is a very well-armed force and quite numerous. Mm. One should not forget that it was uh, a couple of years ago that the Chinese Coast Guard protected fishing vessels that were exploiting Argentinian fish resources and actually saw off the Argentinian response. And so uh, those examples, I think, tell us that China is not a kind of player that we can have a comfortable relationship with yet. But uh, what might change in the future? Well, population densities are one story, but uh, I think the growth of young people and connectedness in China uh, might serve uh, to overthrow the entanglement of the Chinese Communist Party. I don't know. Um, and of course, we are seeing play out in our region at the moment what's happening in Hong Kong and the concerns we're seeing in Taipei. Um, so there are some very big issues out there, but most of them, uh, from where we sit, focus on how does China respond and behave as the central ingredient of building anything that might look like a coalition. Thank you, sir. Uh, for Dr Brewster, you note the flexibility and lack of formal structures of the Indo-Pacific as a strength. Is there a possibility that this is also a weakness when developing strategy in the sea becoming immensely cumbersome? Uh, look, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, these... Uh, the characteristics often have to, uh, you know, a good side and a bad side. Uh, flexibility can also mean lack of co cohesiveness. Um, I think my point is that, uh, and why I talked quite a lot about these minilateral structures, is that um, uh, multilateral arrangements in the Indo-Pacific, because of the size and the diversity of the region, are extremely difficult to put together. And so that's why the practical focus in addressing security issues is more and more going to be on um, small groupings, the coalition of, your, of the willing and the able, I I if you like, and other um, nations can come and plug and play uh, to the extent they have a particular interest uh, in the region. And so, Yes, flexibility is a good thing, but uh, when you have flexibility, it means that you have to cut your cloth for that and uh, create flexible structures, flex flexible coalitions, which will address particular issues rather than trying to develop some grand multilateral structure which will address everything and is unlikely to work. Thank you. And uh, to Mr Svensson, what can navies learn from commercial shipping about lower emissions operations and sea lift? Yeah, I, I think on the, um, on the emissions, of course, with the world's navies, uh, the navies have the same problems as, uh, as the commercial shipping fleet has. And uh, I, I think it's one of technology. And uh, I, I hope the, the great navies of the world, including the ones in this uh, this uh, room will think about the uh, R&D and, and collaboration about how to solve some of the same issues. Um, uh, we, we have started this uh, coalition for, um, for decarbonizing shipping and uh, we hope that some of the findings for that will benefit everything that floats. So, um, but it, it's clearly much bigger than 
one company and it's bigger than, than one country and it, it, it's a problem that needs to be solved. On, on the sea lift, I'm not an expert, first of all, I, I, I must uh, state, but, but I think what, what seems to me to be a good idea is that in a world with less resources and more need, that collaboration is happening where people can add value to each other. And uh, uh, people like us are very good at uh, sailing ships efficiently within a certain purpose. And, and maybe as you, as you look ahead and, and struggle to make budgets uh, meet and, and w whatever, maybe some of these solutions can be useful as what the Americans, I think, has done very successfully. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wallace, um, a question for you about climate change. Um, how should regional powers and navies respond to the effects of climate change? Um, thank you. Well, I, I should say, I mean, my, my talk is always very much directed at government policy, and I figure if I scream into the abyss long enough, someone will hear me. Um, and I know that there's, you know, there's some limited amount that, that, that can be done often at the more operational level about, about high government policy. But if we're thinking about the Australian Navy and regional navies, I mean, focusing on HADR, which I know that, that you already do, is just going to become, I think, much more, of a, much more of a task that you're going to have to deal with in the Pacific and, and elsewhere. So improving our, um, our focus on that. And we have done quite well recently in the Pacific Islands on that, as we have done in a long time. I have a whole chapter in my book about our HADR operations in the Pacific and the very important role that they play in our defence diplomacy and our building our relationship with Pacific Island states. So I think that for the Navy will be a particular focus, but I think we always need to be feeding up as Australians and the people here at high levels to be feeding up to our government that, that, that our, our domestic policy needs to change as well. I think Admiral Barry outlined very well some of the challenges that are going to happen if we don't. And Sue, would you like to add? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to add to that is say uh, I am the Australian member of an organisation called the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change, and we comprise a whole bunch of uh, retired people, but it includes Europeans, Americans, and uh, Asian countries, uh, and, and we are. As a, as a group, very concerned about the consequences of climate change, uh, not because of greenhouse gases and global warming, but because we don't seem to be putting a handle on uh, uh, limiting emissions as well as doing adaptations. And that, for us, uh, is a future that we don't like. The other thing I should say about navies, and I think this is very instructive, uh, the UK's climate change envoy was a rear admiral. The United States uh, Defence Organisation's paper on climate change consequences was written by the United States Navy and in particular a former US naval oceanographer. Uh, and the point I'm making is that as sailors, I think we share uh, a lot of the concerns we read about on climate change and climate change consequences. Uh, and as white suitors, I think there is a lot we can do together to try and remind uh, political leaderships that this is an important issue and it's something that we all need to work on because, frankly, we're not going to save the planet by telling everybody else it's their problem. Perfect. Thanks, sir. Uh, Mr Sensen, do merchant shipping lines conduct contingency planning for the potential impact of regional conflicts or, indeed, more widespread conflict? So, so this was one of my points, is that we, we live and operate uh, as a civilian company in a rule-based society where we, we don't do that. Uh, we, we sail the ships uh, every week in the networks around the world, and as the world unfolds, we respond and plan to those um, situations, many times in, by advice by this, the nation states that we are homes in. And, uh, and therefore, we are completely reliant on... Uh, on safe and open waterways for, for us to, to operate. Of course, when, when the world starts to be unsafe in a certain areas, we do what we can to protect our people and our assets. Thank you. Um, for Dr. Brewster, how can the Quad countries cooperate and synchronise maritime security capacity building efforts at the operational level across the Indo-Pacific? Yes, I mean, I think that this is really the key uh, role that um, the Quad, or, or the most important role that the Quad grouping can play. In my talk, I uh, mentioned that um, 
the um, Coast Guard agencies of the Quad countries uh, could get together uh, and coordinate their efforts. But uh, I think that there's a lot more that can be done at both the governmental and Navy issue, Navy um, levels. And it's not just the Quad countries. It, um, uh, obviously, uh, US, Japan, India and Australia, are, are, but also alongside France, are the most active countries in the Indo-Pacific in uh, assisting um, uh, developing countries to improve their um, maritime security. Um, currently, uh, with some exceptions, that's being done on a pretty uncoordinated basis. It's just, um, you know, one country will choose, uh, one of the Quad partners will choose certain countries to assist and that lack of coordination uh, creates inefficiencies and overlaps. And I think uh, one of the most important things that could be done by the Quad is to get together uh, navies and uh, relevant gov government agencies to make a plan about which countries are prior in priority need of assistance, who's going to provide that assistance and, and how. Thank you. Uh, certainly some great questions coming through, so thank you to the audience. Um, for Joanne Wallace, what immediate steps do you suggest Australia take to mend the arguably neglected relationships with Pacific Island states to achieve the desired geostrategic posture or environment? Thank you. This is clearly a Dorothy Dixon by one of my friends, so thank you whoever did it. <laughs> We've got eight minutes, so let's get comfortable. Okay, no, just joking. Um, there's a couple of things. Obviously, climate change, and I think we've addressed that enough, but changing our position on that is an obvious thing to do. But there are other things that we could do. Rethinking our policy of criminal deportations. We have heard and we heard yesterday about how transnational crime is increasing problem in Pacific Islands, and that is increasingly being fuelled by criminal deportees, Pacific Island deportees from Australia back to the islands, who have now, as a result of having been in Australia and been in Australian prisons, very well developed criminal networks here that is just fuelling transnational crime in the region. That needs to be rethought, I would argue, or at least th talking to our Pacific um, neighbours more about how we can do that differently. Another thing, and that connects to my second point, is listening to the Pacific and what their priorities are. And I'm not sure that we always do this enough. And I'm fortunately actually on the expert advisory board of a group now at Western Sydney University who's doing a study of this where they're going out and listening in the Pacific. So hopefully we'll have some feedback on that in the next few months. Labor mobility and increased access to Australia. We do have our seasonal worker program and the Pacific Labor Scheme, which does allow um, short-term visits here and, and for semi low and semi-skilled workers. But increasing labour mobility for our Pacific Islander neighbours would be incredibly important. It's somewhat ironic that we talk about the Pacific Islands as our family, yet it's incredibly difficult for Pacific Islanders often to come to visit us. And I think that's a strange way to treat your family. Another one is um, infrastructure. And, and David mentioned the BRI. And the, often the fact that the projects um, that are built by the Chinese are, are, are of um, a substandard quality and are not sufficiently maintained. I'd note that that's actually changing the Pacific. And a colleague of mine at the ANU, Graham Smith, does a lot of research on Chinese infrastructure in the Pacific. And he has reported back, and he reported back at the workshop that I referred to, that a lot of Chinese infrastructure now in the Pacific is being built to a much higher standard. There is a responsiveness by the Chinese contractors to improving their standards. So I don't think we should rest on our laurels and just say, oh, what they build is, is no good. What we offer is a much more attractive alternative. That situation is changing. But we do have a comparative advantage that the Chinese don't have, and this connects back to my point about labour mobility. We can leverage off some of the things that we have that are attractive to the Pacific to improve the attractiveness of our infrastructure projects and also multiply the effects of them. And I'm thinking here of the fact that Australian projects built in the Pacific could offer apprenticeships to Pacific Islander workers. We could build in much more capacity for Pacific Islander workers to be working on our infrastructures and infrastructure projects in the Pacific, gaining qualifications and, and experience with Australian companies that would then make them attractive as workers who could come to Australia. So there are ways that, that we can build and make our infrastructure projects more, a more attractive alternative without just relying on what I think might be starting to be an outdated assumption that they're just inherently better quality. Great, thank you. Uh, over to Mr Svensson. One of the factors that keeps shipping safe in, safe in conflict is the notion of neutrality of trade. By contracting to work with militaries, is the neutrality of merchant shipping being jeopardised? Yeah, so 
so we we trade uh, within the the rules of uh, of sanction with with every nation in the world. That's the the nature of of, of connecting all these countries on the globe. And I I, I think the as I presented that the benefit of trade is, is clearly understood and uh, I hope everybody can work through their differences to continue to keep us on that trajectory so we solve our problems. Um, <clears throat> Maersk is a Danish company and uh, uh, was founded uh, at a time and in a world where, where uh, we, we owe our liberty and uh, to, to nations that, 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 that helped and uh, and uh, I, so, in, in, so in that sense, uh, our allegiance, if you will, is clear. I don't think there's anything, uh, as a commercial company, we, we want to, to trade with the world. And uh, I, I think it's possible to do both. We do a lot of trade in and out of China. We have a, a lot of important clients in China, and we do a lot of business with them, and we hope to continue to do that also in the future, of course. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brewster, are there risks in conflating the Quad with the Indo-Pacific, considering that the Quad countries are geographically peripheral or removed from the region? Yeah, I'm, look, I'm, I'm sort of trying to understand that question a little bit. Uh, I think the key point of my presentation was do not do that. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is a region, an imagined region, as all regions are, and uh, countries will have strategies towards a region. One strategy towards that region by a few of the countries is the Quad. Come together and cooperate and provide assistance or uh, infrastructure, etc. But there's a whole bunch of other um, uh, strategies by other countries that they could adopt towards the Indo-Pacific. We saw ASEAN quite recently adopting their own uh, 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 strategy towards the Indo-Pacific. So let me be clear, the Quad is not the Indo-Pacific. The Quad is a response to the Indo-Pacific by really the four main democratic maritime powers within the region that naturally will get together to work towards, work with each other. But other countries within the region will have their own strategies and their own responses. Great, thank you. Probably time for one more question. Admiral Barry, for how much longer will the current conception of modern sovereign states last before it needs to be thrown out or a disruption event occurs which sees a massive shift? Okay, I'm glad I got the easy one. <laughs> uh, look, I think um, if you're like me, you're probably a lot concerned about <clears throat> the collapse of political systems as we know and understand them. I look at the United States, I look at Brexit, I look at what's going on in Hungary, uh, and I look sometimes at our own politics too. And I'm concerned that we've lost the idea of uh, globalisation and connectedness at the political leadership level, but I don't believe it's true of communities. I think, uh, and I'd be very surprised, there are people in this room who are not connected to a worldwide circle of friends and contacts uh, in, uh, in what is a very different kind of world than the one that I grew up in. So um, here's the gig. If you um, study climate science, you might well be concerned by what Professor Will Stephan calls the Great Acceleration. And the Great Acceleration, which uh, according to Will, may be uh, just uh, five years away, or it might be 15 years away, is the point at which the emissions uh, of greenhouse gases into the planet create a situation in which we are not, as human beings, able to control temperature increases. And that means it's an existential threat. So uh, I think some point uh, when we get close to a tipping point that looks like the great acceleration and hothouse surf, we might suddenly say to ourselves, you know what, this planet with nine and a half billion people on it uh, can only save itself if we all pull our weight. And I think at that point, we will lose that concept of sovereignty and competition and being better and all those kinds of things. 
and change our identity from being uh, citizens of villages, states, countries uh, and regions to, you know what, we're all on the same planet. Great. Thank you, sir. That uh, ends our session three. I'd just like to thank the panel um, for those in-depth answers to a number of great questions. So thank you to everybody involved. But particularly, thank you, Admiral Barry, for, uh, for chairing the, uh, the, the panel, to, Dr. Uh, to Mr Svensson, to Dr Brewster and Dr Wallace. Thank you very much for your time and your presentations today.